Hi, welcome back to Joe Blogs. I posted my first ever video on Evergrande on the 26th of September 2021, and almost two and a half years later, it's finally happened. Evergrande has gone into liquidation. Big news out of mainland China. A winding up order has been issued by the Hong Kong court on Evergrande. It is the world's most indebted property developer. It has more than $300 billion worth of liabilities. Evergrande shares fell by more than 20% on the news before trading was suspended. Shares in the mainland property developer alongside its two listed units have been suspended from trade. Evergrande first defaulted on its debts of more than $300 billion US back in 2021. Evergrande has been the poster child of China's nationwide property debt crisis. Evergrande had been working on a $23 billion debt revamp plan with bondholders. But those efforts were scuppered last September when billionaire founder Hui Kayan was put under investigation for suspected crimes. The court today ordered the liquidation of assets. Now the liquidation order is likely to deepen the crisis in the sector and jolt China's fragile capital markets. Beijing was already grappling with an underperforming economy and stocks wallowing near five-year lows. Now any new hit to markets could undermine revival efforts and ramp up demands for more stimulus measures. Uh, this also makes history. This is the first court-ordered liquidation uh, that we are seeing it take place here and uh, what it will mean for the rest of the mainland property developers because this is not the only one that has defaulted and not the only one that has been issued with winding up orders by some of its creditors. So Evergrande has now finally succumbed to the liquidation process. But what does this actually mean for China, the property market and the Chinese economy? Well, in today's video, we'll talk through the details of what a liquidation actually entails, what will actually happen to these companies. We'll also have a look at the company structure because Evergrande is extremely complicated. It has thousands of different companies within the group. And the majority of those companies are located in mainland China. And this liquidation order has been issued by a Hong Kong court. So we'll talk about what the implications of that are and whether or not the liquidator will be able to gain access to the onshore Chinese assets. We'll also talk about what's going on in the property sector and what the implications of this liquidation mean for other companies that are in financial difficulty in China. And then finally today, I'll wrap up with my summary as to what I think is likely to happen with both the liquidation of Evergrande and the implications of this for the Chinese economy. But before we get started on all of that, I'd like to say once again, Thank you so much to everybody that's supporting the channel. If you bought me a coffee or sent me a YouTube super thanks or signed up as a patron or a member, thank you so much. Your support really keeps the channel going, so thank you. A liquidation situation occurs for companies when they get themselves into a position where they're unable to repay their debts. So they've taken on too much debt, the value of the company falls below the value of that debt, and that you get a situation where creditors are not going to be paid back all of the money that they lent to the company or invested into the company. And this is a court-run procedure. As we saw at the beginning of today's video, the liquidation of Evergrande has been decided upon by a Hong Kong court because a liquidation order was submitted by some of the creditors. And in Evergrande's situation, the creditors were the bondholders. So the international bonds that Evergrande issued to institutions all around the world Evergrande defaulted on those bonds back in 2021, which meant that they were no longer able to keep servicing the debt. They couldn't actually pay all of the interest as it was due. And as a result of that, the creditors have rights within the document. And they decided to put a petition forward to the courts to say, we would like our money back. And if the company can't repay us through cash flow, then we would like to liquidate the company. So basically, close the company down, sell all of the assets and give us back as much as you possibly can. And the big question with regards to the liquidation of Evergrande is what is going to be the value? Is there really any point to the creditors forcing this liquidation through? Will the creditors actually get back any debt whatsoever? Well, the people who will decide that are the liquidators. So the liquidators are generally a firm of accountants, so an independent body who will be appointed to run Evergrande. So the board of Evergrande will have to sign over all of their rights to the liquidator. So you will have a load of accountants coming in with their briefcases and they will now control the company. 
and they are acting in the interests of the creditors. So whether that be investors or debt holders, doesn't really matter. They are independent. And what the liquidators will be focused on doing is maximizing the return. They will want to get back as much money as possible to give back to all of the creditors. And the way that they do that is either by selling all of the assets if they can find a buyer, or alternatively, they may decide that the best possible option is actually to continue running the company as a going concern. So in the situation of Evergrande, they'll need to make a decision as to whether or not it's worth continuing with these building projects if they can make more money actually completing the builds and then completing the sale of all of those apartments or if they would be better to shut the thing down and just cut their losses. So there's going to be a lot of decisions that need to be taken by the liquidators because as I mentioned at the start of the video, the company structure for Evergrande is incredibly complicated. So let's have a look at what the structure actually looks like. Now, before we dive into the detail of the actual structure of Evergrande, I thought it was worth having a look at this simplified version because we can talk through exactly what's been happening. And this simplified chart has been split into two sections. The section at the top relates to all of the offshore companies. So all of the companies that are operating outside of China and the section at the bottom is all of the onshore companies. So all of those that are located within China. And if we start off right at the top, you can see that the main offshore company is China Evergrande Group. And this is the company that is being forced into liquidation. And as you can see from the dotted line, it was the issuer of all of the overseas bonds. And the total value of all of those overseas bonds is somewhere in the region of $23 billion, which is obviously a large amount of money in itself, but only a small fraction of the $300 billion of debt that the China Evergrande Group in total owes. Now, if we quickly look at the four subsidiary companies that sat below China Evergrande Group, the biggest single portion of the offshore group was the building companies, and there were more than 235 subsidiary companies. And the way that Evergrande set up its building companies was that for each project, it established a different limited entity. So the 235 plus companies represent 235 plus different building projects outside of China. The next biggest offshore subsidiary was Evergrande Property Services Group. And this was the property management services that Evergrande got involved with. And the offshore business owned 61% of that company. Evergrande also had its electric vehicle company called New Energy Vehicle Group Limited which is a business that is set up to build electric cars. However, it still hasn't produced one vehicle. And the final subsidiary was Heng Ten Networks Group Limited, which was a media business, which has subsequently been sold. If we now move down to the onshore part of the group, which is the mainland China businesses, you can see that there are over 1,850 subsidiary companies representing more than 1,850 different building projects. And as you'll know, if you've been following the channel, some of these projects are absolutely huge. Evergrande was effectively building whole cities for some of these projects. So this chart gives you a flavor as to the structure of the Evergrande group. But let's have a look at the actual structure chart. This chart provides a more detailed breakdown of the Evergrande group and really puts into perspective how difficult this liquidation process is going to be because the liquidators are going to have to try to evaluate the value of each individual company within this group. They will need to look at the assets and liabilities of all of these different entities. And once they've done that, they will then need to establish what the best course of action is for every single one of these entities. And as you can imagine, that's going to be a very complicated process because the vast majority of these companies are located in mainland China. And therefore, the liquidators will be relying on all of the different people involved in those companies in sharing all of their information, their detailed information of assets and liabilities. And when you consider that a lot of these businesses are property development businesses, so they're building projects, they're having to spend money on lots of different things, all the different materials, all the different tradesmen, all of the different sales that are going on, it's going to be extremely complicated. And I would bet there isn't a centrally organized system that enables the liquidators to be able to see all of this at the push of a button. So how long is the liquidation process likely to take? 
And what's the estimated outcome for all of the creditors? Well, as I mentioned at the start of the video, I first posted a video on Evergrande back in September 2021, which was almost two and a half years ago. So it's taken that length of time for this liquidation to come about because at that point, Evergrande didn't have enough money to be able to repay all of its creditors, but it's managed to spin things out for all of this period. And it's likely that the liquidation process will take years. The chart that we just looked at was incredibly complicated. There are thousands of different companies within this group. And beneath all of those companies are thousands of different developments. And they're at various stages. On some of those projects, Evergrande haven't even broken ground yet. They just own the land. Whereas on others, they've taken money from people in advance of the building of those projects, and they're still needing to build out all of those apartments. And the liquidators officially will be in charge of everything that happens for every single one of those companies. So it's going to take the liquidators months and months just to be able to get their head around exactly what's happening right now. They'll then need to draw up all of the assets and liabilities for all of those individual companies and the group as a whole. And then they'll need to start making decisions as to whether or not those developments are viable. So they'll need to look at things like what's happening in the property market, what's happening with prices, whether or not the apartments that they're building are going to sell for anything like the price that they'd originally budgeted. If they don't, whether or not they can still make a profit. So there are a lot of complicating factors that are going to need to be fed into the models that these liquidators are running. One of the options that liquidators always consider when they take over a company is selling it lock, stock and barrel, trying to find a buyer to take over the entire business. But clearly from Evergrande's point of view, that's unlikely to happen. This company has $300 billion worth of debt and it doesn't really have a lot of cash flow because it's taken a lot of money in advance for the sale of these apartments and that money has been used on other developments. So it isn't really a going concern. And also when you take a look at what's happening in the property sector in China, nobody else is in a position to step in and take over all of these assets. And where Evergrande has been selling assets, it's been selling them to the state. It's been selling it to state-backed property developers. And the Chinese state is very unlikely to step in and bail out the liquidators because it decided it didn't want to bail out Evergrande at all. It was happy for this liquidation to go ahead. So the liquidators aren't really in the position to be able to sell the company as a going concern. And so they're going to have to try to eke out as much cash as possible from every single one of these developments. And that is going to take a very long period of time. We could be talking five years, it could be even longer. We could be looking at a 10 year liquidation process before these liquidators finally get to the end of the road. And in terms of recovery, it's very unlikely that the creditors are going to see anything back on their debt. Because as part of the court process, Evergrande instructed Deloitte, the international accounting firm, of what the likely recovery would be. And Deloitte's estimate was 3.4% on the dollar. And if the recovery does come in at that level, it would mean that out of the $300 billion worth of debt, the creditors might get back around $10 billion. But unfortunately, from the creditors' point of view, the liquidators' costs and fees always come first. So if the liquidator does sit in this company for three, five or 10 years, it's likely that it will build up billions of dollars in costs and could wipe out any recovery at all. So the creditors are extremely unlikely to see anything back on the money that they put into Evergrande. So what are the implications of this liquidation on the Chinese property market? Well, if you've been following the channel, you'll know that the Chinese property market is currently on its knees. Sales are down, prices are down, and most of the developers are in severe financial difficulty. As a result of the three red lines policy that was introduced by the Chinese authorities a few years ago, the Chinese property developers are no longer able to access low cost and easy to get debt 
it's very difficult for them to be able to get money to be able to continue their builds. And as a result of all of those factors, the confidence in the Chinese property market is at an all time low. Consumers are now very concerned about what's happening because there are a lot of people who've taken on mortgages for properties that haven't even been built yet. So the implications of this liquidation could actually make things significantly worse because there are a number of other Chinese property developers that also have offshore debt that could also go through the same process and go to the Hong Kong courts and be forced into liquidation. And if that happens, what will happen is that liquidators will start taking over these companies and the liquidators will be a lot more cautious than the current management teams because they are only looking after the interests of the creditors. They are trying to get the best return for all of the people that that company owes money to. They're not looking to grow the businesses, to take on more debt and to take risks. They're looking to just get cash out of the entities. So there is a real chance here that this announcement of Evergrande's liquidation could actually trigger a domino fall of all different property developers. We could see tens or maybe even hundreds of other developers going into a liquidation process. And if that happens, it's likely we'll see a further slowdown in the builds in China, which is likely to lead to a further loss of confidence because all of those people, the millions of Chinese individuals who are waiting for their apartments to be delivered, will have to wait longer because it will take longer to build them. And so people are less likely to sign up to buy new properties. And so we could see a further fall in prices, a further fall in sales, and even more property developers getting into difficulty. And the reason that this is really important is that the property sector equates to around 25% of the total economy in China. So if the sector goes into further decline, it will drag down the overall economy and cause more problems for China in 2024 and beyond because property isn't something that turns around overnight. This is going to have a long lasting impact on the Chinese economy. So what's the summary and conclusion today? Well, I wanted to post this video because the announcement that Evergrande is now formally in liquidation is a big event. I've been talking about Evergrande and the Chinese property market for almost two and a half years. And in fact, back in September 21, Evergrande was sitting on the verge of liquidation at that point. So it's taken a very long time to happen, but it's finally here. But as we've talked about in today's video, it's not going to end quickly. It's actually very unlikely that we'll see a conclusion to this liquidation process in this decade. I think it's likely to take around 10 years. So it might actually be sometime in the 2030s that I'm posting a video telling you what the final outcome of the Evergrande liquidation process is. But I think the issue that really is key for the Chinese economy is what's happening in the property sector and what the implications of this liquidation means for other property developers. The fact that the Hong Kong court has now decided that it's legal for Evergrande's overseas assets to be put into liquidation definitely spells bad news for the other property developers in China that also have overseas assets because this is setting a precedent. It's likely now that the creditors from all of those other businesses will be looking to force liquidation processes because this is really a point of principle. As we've talked about, the recovery that the creditors are likely to see from the Evergrande process is going to be minimal, if anything at all. When you're talking about 3.4% at best, it's very likely that it will be nothing because the liquidators will use up a lot of that cash paying themselves. And also it's likely when you start lifting all of the stones and looking what's underneath them, that the assets that have been shown on the balance sheet aren't actually that tangible. So realistically, I don't think many of the creditors will be expecting to get back anything. I'm sure they've written down the value of all of their bonds to zero a long time ago. But the point here is that this is potentially going to cause major issues for China in terms of its future investment. As I talked about in a recent video, direct investment into Chinese businesses in 2023 hit an all time low. It actually came off a cliff. 
And one of the reasons that investment is down is that people are concerned not just about what's happening in the Chinese economy, which obviously is concerning because it's in a state of flux at the moment, but also whether or not you can trust what's going to happen with those companies in the long term. And I think that's one of the questions that's thrown up by this liquidation process. It will be fascinating to see how much access the liquidators of the Evergrande offshore businesses are given to the onshore companies that are sitting in China, because the vast majority of the assets and the value of the Evergrande group is in those companies in mainland China. And I would be surprised if the Chinese authorities are happy for the liquidators to start closing down businesses within China, stopping developments and asking for all of the money to be sent to Hong Kong so it can be handed out to international national creditors. I don't think that's likely to happen. And I think what will be fascinating as part of this process is to see exactly how all of this unfolds. And if it's proven as part of this process that any assets that are sitting in China are effectively ring-fenced and protected from the liquidation process, that will provide a deterrent to people investing from overseas into China. Because what we might see is the Chinese authorities effectively closing ranks and not allowing any of that value to leave China, meaning that overseas investors will just have to wear all of their losses. And that could have serious implications for China looking to raise investment in the future. Because as an overseas investor, you don't want to take the risk when something goes wrong that you just basically get completely taken out, completely wiped out because China is looking after itself. And I think that's the real risk from China's perspective is that this liquidation process could expose the fact that China doesn't want to play ball when things go wrong. But the other issue, obviously, from today's video is that the property sector equates to 25% of the Chinese economy. And the fact that Evergrande has now gone into liquidation is likely to have a domino effect on lots of other developers. They are now at risk of also going into liquidation. There is less money kicking around in the Chinese economy to be able to finish these builds. And there's a genuine risk that the developments will move at an even slower pace than they've been moving for the last few years, which will cause a further confidence of crisis amongst Chinese consumers. They're less likely to want to buy property in the future if their existing properties haven't been built or they're going down in value, which is what's happening right now. So all of this means that the property sector is likely to weaken further over the next three to five years. And that's going to be really bad news for the Chinese economy because when 25% of your economy is in decline, it's very difficult to then achieve the 5% growth that China is talking about for 2024. So the overall summary of today's video is that finally we've seen the liquidation of Evergrande being announced. That's bad news for Evergrande and its creditors who are likely to get back nothing in terms of all of the money that they put into the company, the $300 billion worth of debt that the company has. But it's also seriously bad news for the property sector. And as the property sector makes up such a large part of the economy in China, it's very bad news for the Chinese economy. So hopefully you've enjoyed today's video. You found it useful, informative and thought provoking. If you've liked what I've said, then please give me a thumbs up. Thank you for watching this video all the way through to the end. And here's something to put a smile on your face.